Hello there and welcome. I'm your host, Michelle Marchant Johnson, and I'm so thrilled and honored to have you here with me for this event called Fuel Your Feminine Fire, where the goal of myself and my guest is to help you love yourself, love your life, and find real love. And we're excited about bringing this because the last couple of years, without uh, us needing to say that, have been challenging for many, many people. And we want to kind of like light or reignite that spark in your life. So we hope that these interviews and this program could be inspirational and helpful to so many of you out there. And I'd like to welcome our special guest today. I'm so thrilled and honored to have her on the program. And that is the lovely and amazing Dr. Margaret Paul. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to have you, Margaret, because I just think your work and the things that you do in the world are so incredibly valuable and have helped so many people. And so I love tapping into your wisdom and being able to feature your work on the program. So super excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. I love I really love spending this time with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really honored. So we're going to be talking today about the one major cause of most relationship problems, which I know, Margaret, this is going to be so valuable to the people listening. Before we jump in there, though, I want to just give a little formal introduction to those who may not be as familiar with your work. Dr. Margaret Paul is the best-selling author of is a best-selling author, relationship expert, and co-creator of the powerful inner bonding self-healing process. She's appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including Oprah. Her book titles include, Do I Have to Give Up Me to Be Loved by You? Over 1 Million Sold. I love that. And I love that question because that's such a big question that comes up in relationships. <laughs> Right. So while you nailed it with that title, I can see why it sold a million copies, <laughs> over a million copies. Healing Your Aloneness, Inner Bonding, and the recently released Diet for Divine Connection. The Inner Bonding Workbook and Six Steps, six steps to Total Self-Healing. Um, Margaret has also successfully worked with hundreds of thousands around the world and taught classes and seminars for over 53 years. Margaret is also a member of the Transformational Leadership Council started by Jack Canfield. I think I can't say um, six steps to total self-healing fast six times, Margaret, or that's <laughs> right. for me. But I love all of the uh, I love all of the alliteration there. That's beautiful. <laughs> so we're going to be talking, as I said, about the one major cause of most relationship problems. So let's just dive in right there, Margaret. Tell us why you. <laughs> why you chose this topic and and why you feel like this is so relevant as a place to start. Well, I've been dealing with relationships for so long. And so over and over and over, I see the same issue. And the, the issue that uh, I would call it self-abandonment. Um, most people do not understand what it means to abandon themselves and the various ways that they abandon themselves and then why that leads to so many relationship problems. Um, you know, most of us have been brought up not with the concept of learning to be loving to ourselves and to share our love, which creates a wonderful relationship, but have been brought up to think that our worth and our safety and our sense of self um, is in getting love. And this is how most people enter relationships like, oh, you know, I'll find somebody to love me and completely complete me and make me feel safe and make me feel whole and give me my sense of worth. That whole concept comes from not knowing how to love ourselves, not knowing how to see who we really are, not knowing how to value our true soul essence. And we have so much role modeling in our families of our parents or other caregivers abandoning themselves. And so, of course, that's what we do when we come into our relationship. So what I'd like to do is go through the four major ways that people abandon themselves. And then maybe people can see why self-abandonment is the major cause of relationship failure. That sounds wonderful. That sounds wonderful. And yeah, I, I think this mm -hmm this idea or this concept of self-abandonment is going to be new for a number of people. So we would love for you to 
share the four ways. Okay, so when when we were growing up, many of us had a lot of pain and we didn't have any way of handling it. And so one of the things we learned to do, we learned to do many things to avoid our pain so that we could survive. One of the things we learned to do is to disconnect from our body, dissociate from our feelings and go up into our head. Because when we're focused in our mind, we don't feel our feelings so much. But this would be like if you had a child who came to you upset and instead of attending to the child, you're involved in reading or you're on the computer or you're thinking about something. The child doesn't feel love. The child feels abandoned because you're not attending. And what most people don't realize is that all of our feelings have vital information for us. They're not something to avoid. They're not something to push down and get rid of. Every single feeling is coming from our what we call the inner child, which is our soul or feeling self and is informing us about whether we're loving ourselves or abandoning ourselves. It's informing us about what's happening with other people or situations. Our feelings are a major source of inner knowing. And so when we avoid them, we're missing out on this huge amount of information. And so one of the ways we abandon ourselves is to stay up in our head. And then we don't even know what we feel. A second way is that many Before of us. Before you go have, on to the second yeah. one, Margaret, is this like, like suppressing feelings or ignoring them or pushing? It's ignoring them. them. Yeah, yeah. It's ignoring the feelings by staying up in our mind so that you might not even know you have a feeling going on. Mm -hmm. So we're and just so disconnected. We're just disconnected. disconnected. Yeah. And lots of times when I work with my clients and I'll have them go inside and ask what they feel, they don't know. They feel nothing. They feel numb because they've been disconnecting for so long. So the second way is that we judge ourselves. Many of us were judged and we tend to treat ourselves the way that we were treated or the ways our, our parents or caregivers treated themselves or treated each other. So there's a part of us that in the inner bonding process that I teach is called the wounded self, the ego wounded self that is very judgmental. And it can come in with, oh, you're not good enough. What's the matter with you? You're such a jerk. You said the wrong thing. You're going to end up on the streets. No one will ever love you. You're always going to be alone. This is the kind of thing that the wound itself has been programmed to tell us. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were telling that to a child, how do you think the child would feel? You know, the child would feel anxious, would feel depressed, might feel angry. Hurt. And so, yeah. yeah. And so we're causing a lot of our own pain by ignoring our feelings and then by judging ourselves. And then a third way is that we, we suppress our feelings with various addictions. You know, you'll have a feeling before you even know you have a feeling you'll be grazing in front of the refrigerator or you'll or you'll be watching TV or you'll be overworking or you'll be blaming somebody or buying something or or being on the Internet with pornography or using sex with a partner or um, taking a drug or alcohol or nicotine, something to avoid your feeling. Now, again, if you had a child who came to you upset and you just grabbed a drink that child's going to feel abandoned. And that's what we do to ourselves. And the fourth way, which has a huge effect on relationships, is that we make another person responsible for our feelings. We're upset. We blame them. We're upset. We, we go to them to try and get them to make us feel okay. Now, again, that would be like if you had a child and instead of being there for the child's feelings, you just kept trying to adopt the child out to somebody, that child's going to feel rejected by you, going to feel abandoned by you. That's what's going on with most people, is that most people are actually abandoning themselves in all four ways. When you do that, you're creating an emptiness inside. It's like a black hole. And that black hole is like a vacuum with a partner. So if you're abandoning yourself and then you're coming to your partner, having abandoned yourself, you're coming in a needy state and you're going to be pulling on your partner to fill up that black hole with their love. Now, the problem is that we attract at our common level 
of self-love or our common level of self-abandonment. So if you're abandoning yourself, so is your partner. And they're going to be pulling on you for your love. You're going to be pulling on them for their love. But when you're not loving yourself, when you don't know how to fill yourself with love, you don't have any love to share. So eventually there's a lot of conflict or a lot of distance because you're going to be very disappointed that this person is not giving you the love that you need to be giving yourself. You're not giving it to them. That does not create a loving and connected, alive, passionate, intimate relationship. Yeah. And it strikes me when you, when you describe it as a black hole, when I think of a black hole, it's like the bottomless pit. There's never going to be enough to fill that. Never black enough. Hole, right. It's never yeah. enough. There's That's always right. going to feel like lack and deprivation. And it's not enough, no matter how loving another partner is, if we're looking for that to come in from the outside. Yeah. And lots of times a partner who may be abandoning their themselves too will try and caretake you. They'll try and give, give you the love so that you'll give them the love back. And of course that doesn't work. And like you said, no matter how much somebody gives you from the outside, if you're abandoning yourself, it's not going to make any difference. It's like a bucket with a hole in it. It just goes right out. It may feel good for the moment, like any addiction, but it doesn't stick. It can't stick when you're judging yourself, when you're ignoring your feelings. Uh, there's no way that you can end up feeling safe and secure and filled up with love when you're abandoning yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is this why, you know, we, we hear a lot about the importance of self love Yeah, and that's something that has, you know, a term that's been around for a long time, but I think it's still vague for a lot of people. Right. And, And is this, so I'd like to explore that a little bit with you. And then also, Um, Is this why we hear that you can only receive love to the extent that you can love yourself because it feels so unfamiliar and it feels so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Is that why that is, is a truism, so to speak? Yeah, that's exactly right. If you're rejecting and abandoning yourself, how are you going to take in something that somebody else is giving you? That wounded part comes in and says, Oh yeah, but, That's not true. Or they don't know you. Or if they really knew you, they wouldn't say that about you. That's what our wounded self does with that kind of judgment. So it doesn't land. It doesn't stick when we're abandoning ourselves. So, yeah, let's talk about loving yourself. One of my favorite topics. And that's what the yeah. and, And that's what the inner bonding process is all about. It's about learning to love yourself. Now, a lot of people believe that loving yourself is like, oh, I get my nails done or I take a hot bath or I eat well or I exercise. And yeah, that's part of it. That's loving yourself on the physical level. But what about emotionally? See, people can be taking care of themselves in a lot of ways. They might take care of themselves financially or physically, but Many people, most people have actually never learned what it means to take responsibility for their own feelings, which means loving yourself emotionally. And so most of the time we're emotionally abandoning ourselves. And that's when we're pulling on somebody else to validate us, to see us, to give us the approval, the love that we're not giving ourselves. And so inner bonding is a six step process that it's a pathway. Like if you follow this pathway, if you practice this pathway, you will learn to love yourself. And the first step, which may be obvious at this point, is to learn to get present in your body with your feelings. If you're going to stay up in your head, if you're going to shove down with addictions, judge yourself, make others responsible, you're not going to be taking care of your own feelings. And so step one is learning to get present inside your body. That's where your feelings are. Not to avoid them, not to dismiss them, but to get present with them. It's like getting present with a child who's crying, you sit, you put your arms around them, you're present. That's what we want to learn to do with ourselves. Get inside and get present with our feelings and decide that we want responsibility. Now, it's important to understand that there's two different kinds of feelings, very distinct different kinds. One is what we call the wounded feelings. And these are the feelings that we cause 
with our self-abandonment. When we abandon ourselves, we make ourselves feel anxious, depressed, angry, alone, empty, jealous, envious, guilty, shamed. All these difficult feelings we're causing with our self-abandonment. Then there's another kind of feeling that comes from life. This is, these are the feelings that come from losing someone we love or having love to share with somebody and nobody's around. This is the loneliness. This is the grief. This is the heartbreak. This is the helplessness over others' unloving behavior or, or painful events happening. These are life situations. Now, when we were young, we might have experienced these really painful feelings. We might have felt helpless over how people were treating us. We might have lost a parent and had such deep grief. We might have been treated really badly or saw um, our parents treating each other badly and, and, and felt helpless and heartbroken. We might have been very lonely when nobody saw us and connected to us. But these were very big feelings and we couldn't manage them. And so we had to develop that ego wounded part of us that learned to abandon us. And then we created the wounded feelings. But the wounded feelings are actually easier to handle than these deeper feelings of life, which we had to avoid. That was part of our survival. But now today, we can manage these feelings with love, with compassion. And so we need to learn to do that. We need to learn to manage these deeper painful feelings of life in order not to abandon ourselves over them and cause the wounded feelings that so many people are experiencing, the anxiety and depression that's rampant in our society and the anger that's rampant. So in step one, we're saying, yeah, I, I want to learn to learn from my feelings and I want to learn to lovingly manage them. Then in step two, we breathe into our heart and we open to learning. In the inner bonding process, there's only two intentions. One is we want to learn about loving ourselves and sharing our love. Or the other is we want to protect against pain. We want to get love, avoid pain with some form of controlling behavior. So we're either in the intention to control or the intention to learn at any given moment. In step two, we consciously choose the intention to learn about loving ourselves. And what we teach people to do is to open to their higher selves. They can imagine an older, wiser part of themselves, like themselves 500 years older than they are. This is your higher self. This is an this is a part of us that can help us understand how to love ourselves and what's real, what's true. And it's actually very natural in our upper right brain. We can naturally do that. But most of us have learned to put a lid on that. So we're going to resurrect in inner bonding the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to access that higher self. So in step two, we're, we're opening to learning and we're saying, I invite the love and the compassion and the strength and the wisdom of our higher self into our heart. And that's what creates what we call the loving adult. We want to be a loving adult. We don't want to be acting from our ego wounded self, which is programmed with all these fears and false beliefs. So then in step three is the loving adult. We go back inside. Let's say that you go inside and you're feeling empty. And so then you would say, well, what am I doing? How am I treating you? What am I telling you that's causing you to feel empty or anxious or depressed? And then we go inside and we let the answer come from inside, from the feeling itself. And we call that the inner child. And that inner child might say, well, you, you ignore me or, or you, you judge me all the time. You tell me I have to be perfect. I have to do everything right. You tell me I'm not going to be lovable unless I get this person's approval or that person's approval. Um, you tell me I'm not good enough. You've got me in a cage. You don't let me be me. There might be all sorts of things that that inner child might say if we're really open to learning. 
And once we understand how we're treating ourselves, what we're telling ourselves, we go a little deeper into that ego wounded part that may be saying, you got to be perfect. You got to do everything right. And we would say, what's the point? What, what, why are you doing that? What are you trying to control or avoid or protect against by judging in that way? And that part, that's where we go into the false beliefs, because that part might say, well, if I'm perfect, then I can have control over how this person feels about me, and then I can get the love I need. Well, that's a huge false belief that most people have. Right. But it doesn't happen to be true. Right. Yeah. We don't have that control over other people. And there's no such thing as perfect. And our essence is already perfect. That's a spark of the divine in us. The wound itself doesn't know anything about that. So it says you got to do everything right. Right. Okay. Right. And and so oh, it's such a such a uh, an audio that plays in so many of our That's heads. right. This this need to feel perfect in order to find love. Where the truth is, if we had to be perfect, none of us would ever find love. No. And, and our authenticity, our realness is part of what makes us lovable and relatable. That's right. But That's right. Yeah, the lie is there so strongly for so many of us that you have. I mean, you know, I've I've dealt with that myself. This perfectionistic kind of thing where that's right. You have to be perfect in order to be lovable. And I think it runs so deep for so many of us. Yeah, that's right. And so then once we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, what we're trying to control or avoid or protect against, then step four is we open again to that higher wisdom, that higher self. We're asking two questions. What is the truth about any of these beliefs? Like, is it true that, first of all, there is a perfect you know, and right. we can know we can know what somebody else thinks that is. Right. <laughs> and secondly, that we can actually control how people feel about us. We can influence. But do we actually have control? So we're asking, is that true? And once people can develop that higher connection, that higher guidance would say, no, nobody controls how you feel about them. They might right. influence you, but they don't control you. Right. And neither do you. And so we're starting to access um, truth about a lot of things, about ourselves, about what we can or can't control. And then we ask, what's loving to us right now? Mm. If I had an actual child who was feeling the way I'm feeling, what would be loving to that child? And we start to access the role modeling that we didn't have, that most of us didn't have as we were growing up for what would be loving to me right now. And it might just be, um, let me grab my, my little bear here. It might just be something like holding a stuffed animal or holding a doll and saying, I'm here. You're not alone. I'm going to start listening to you. I know I've been ignoring you and that's why you're hurting so bad. But I'm going to learn to start to be an adult for you. I know I haven't been, but I want to learn that. Or just to hold that child. Sometimes just holding the feeling will bring a sense of relief. But there's so many other things that our guidance might tell us. It might tell us we have to eat better or get some exercise or, or speak up for ourselves in a relationship or go to bed earlier, or um, go back to school, or there's so many things that we can learn if we're open. I ask all day long, what's loving to me now? What's in my highest good now? And because I've been practicing this for so long, that comes right through me. That information comes through me very quickly. It takes time to um, learn to access that higher truth, that higher knowing, but everybody can with some practice. And then in step five, we have to take the action, whatever it is, we have to take it. Doesn't mean anything if we don't take the action. And then in step six, we go in and we evaluate, how am I feeling now? If I've taken a loving action, I'm gonna feel so much better. I'm gonna feel a sense of relief. So that's very briefly the pathway of inner bonding. And when people learn and practice it, it, it dramatically changes their lives. 
Mm -hmm. So powerful and so beautiful. Uh, so one question I have, um, I know you said anyone can do this with practice, but I've, I've known a few people in my life, and this is just a question I think might be on the minds of a few people in our audience. If you've been detached from feelings for a long time, like I've known a couple of people that have said to me, I, I can't feel anything. I just right. can't feel. Which is kind of hard for us to imagine if we are somewhat connected with our emotions. But if someone's in that place where, you know, the, the numbing or the disconnect has become so profound or has gone on for such a long time that they, they, they just can't feel. I know you're saying it's in the body, but what, what, what do they do with something like that? How, does, how do we overcome something like that? Because I think there's people out there that have been so deeply wounded. Yeah. Have, have the, pain, the feelings have been so painful that there's been a really a complete disconnect. Yeah. So, yes, I work with people very often where they say they have no idea. But that's information. See, if they go inside and they feel nothing or they feel numb, that is actually information. And then they can open to learning and say, what am I doing that's making you feel so numb? What? Am, how am I suppressing you? What am I doing that's making you want to feel nothing at all? And so when we start to inquire, then we might start to get information. Now, sometimes that inner child, that feeling self doesn't want to talk to you because it doesn't trust you because you've been shoving it away for so long that it doesn't want to tell you anything. And when that's the case, then I help people just to develop a loving adult part of themselves, part of themselves that starts to take better care of themselves. You know, if, if you had a baby, the baby can't tell you what's wrong. Right. But if you wanted to be a good parent, like when I had my first son, I, I was the only child. I had no idea how to be a how to be a loving mom, but I wanted to be a loving mom. Right. And so what I did, what I naturally did, because I wanted to be loving to him, is that when he would cry, first of all, I would try things. I would feed him. I would rock him. I would change his diaper. I would pat him. I would try things. And that's what a loving parent will do. They'll try things. But if it didn't work, then I would naturally be thinking, gosh, I wonder what's wrong. I wonder what he needs. That wondering is an intention to learn. And I didn't realize it at the time, but ideas would pop into my mind because I was open. I wanted to know. I wanted to love him. And so when I said, well, what, what does he need? What would be loving? Then ideas would pop in. Well, that's what people need to start to do is to open to what would be loving to them, even if that baby in them can't tell them anything mm -hmm. about what's going on. They can start to practice taking loving care of themselves by practicing opening to that higher source of love and wisdom that's here for everybody. It's always here. And as they do that, they will be developing the loving adult self. And when they become better at taking care of themselves, that part of them will start to feel safe to feel and will start to let them in on what's going on. Mm, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And another question, thank you for answering that because that's <laughs> just something I was wondering about as you were going through this beautiful process. Another thing I wonder about, Margaret, is why do you think it is that so many of us have such a loud voice, uh, such a loud inner critic, or sometimes I call it the inner mean girl. <laughs> right. You know, she's like the bully. That, and, and, the, and like you said, the kinds of things that we say to ourselves or the kinds of thoughts that we have, we'd have no friends in the world if we were saying those out. <laughs> That's to other right. People. They'd never want to speak to us again. That's right. But why is that such a, I mean, that's such a battle for so many of us. And why is that voice so loud and so strong for so many of us? Yeah. Well, we, we absorbed the wounded selves of our parents, how they treated us, how they treated each other, how they treated themselves. We absorbed it from peers, from television, from teachers, from religious leaders. That's what happens when we're growing up. We absorb those wounded voices 
into our mind. And that goes right into the lower left brain. This is where the wounded self is. This is the fight or flight mechanism. And this is the part that gets programmed with those voices that just has to control. It's the survival mechanism here. And so that voice can get very loud, especially if our parents were very judgmental or critical or ignoring of us. That can get very loud <clears throat> when you have not developed your higher feminine. So the, this is the lower left brain. This is the ego wounded self. The lower right brain is our our true self, our essence, our inner child. The upper left brain is the masculine aspect that takes action in the world. And the upper right brain is the feminine aspect that can connect to our higher self. When we haven't developed our feminine and both men and women need to do this, mm -hmm. um, then our our wounded self is our 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 actions of our left brain is being informed by this programmed ego wounded part of us. And our actions tend to be very unloving. And if you look around the world, you can see that happening. I mean, that's what's happening with Putin in the Ukraine. It's just acting out of a wounded part to control to, you know, out of greed, out of fear. When we develop this, when we practice accessing our higher guidance, then we're developing the feminine aspect that really uh, we're born with an ability to do this. And this um, enables us to access love and truth, enables us to nurture our true soul, and enables us to take action from our source of love and truth. And this gets healed. These false beliefs get healed as we develop this. But until we do, we're being governed by these programmed lies, by these programmed false beliefs that we absorbed, that we all did. We all absorbed this as we were growing up. And that's what's creating such a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned this, I think, to one of the other speakers mm -hmm. that I spoke with a couple days ago. And I, I did a class a while back where um, we were talking about, you know, the thoughts and the beliefs and limiting beliefs and how that can sabotage love. And I had the ladies draw a picture of like their inner critic or their inner mean girl um, at just to, you know, just so we could like visually see what this voice might look like. And Margaret, I got the scariest looking pictures you've ever seen. I mean, yeah. these inner mean critics or inner mean girls had claws and horns and big teeth. And, and it was really fascinating to see that. And I thought, wow, isn't that so incredible to have that going on inside? And like now, then they could visually see what this person, this, this part of them was looking like. And, uh, you know, we, we, discovered some of the questions you asked you know what is really the truth and what is the loving you know what's the loving thing we can do here and um you know lovingly inviting her to go on a very long vacation well-deserved vacation <laughs> she's been <laughs> right she's been working so hard for so long uh oh right? yeah right yeah she she was our survival but now she's in the way but you know the other thing that can be helpful for people is to listen to that voice and see who does it remind you of like my voice that critic was both my mother and my father and when i really tuned into it i could say oh yeah that's the voice of my mother or oh yeah that's the voice of my father because we absorb that or a sibling or a teacher or somebody who had a big impact on us whose voice we absorbed. And sometimes it's really helpful to say, oh, my mother's voice is in charge right now. That's right. not going to work well for me. That doesn't feel good. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that is very helpful. And, yeah, that, yeah. and that's come up for me with some of my clients, too, where they've said, uh, they've identified that voice as being the voice of their mother or someone else that, you know, there was a critical voice and giving messages to them as they were growing right. up. It's just incredible, though, how powerful and how strong oh, yeah. and how how mean that voice can be. Well, yeah, I mean, when I started, I started practicing inner bonding 38 years ago when spirit brought it in to me and the co-creator, Dr. Erica Chopich. And um that's all I had. I, I just had that voice. It was ongoing all the time. And it was amazing to me to start to be aware. It was mostly judgments. And I was anxious my whole life 
until I tuned into the fact that the anxiety was coming from all these self-judgments that I, I absorbed my whole life. I didn't start to practice until I was, you know, like in my mid forties and I've been doing that to myself my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really um, interesting because a lot of times we don't even really recognize. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we hear the voice like it's screaming in our heads, but I think more often than not, it's more on the uh, subconscious level. That's right. That's right. Where it's running the whole show, but, but we can't, we don't see it. We don't know it. We don't recognize it. No. And we don't connect our anxiety and depression and guilt and shame and anger and emptiness and all that. We don't connect those feelings with how we're treating ourselves. We don't think it's we who are doing it. We think, oh, it's something out there. This person did that or that situation or this or that. We don't recognize that we're the ones causing those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So powerful. So powerful. And yeah, this idea of Self-abandonment, I think that's something, again, that like it's kind of on autopilot for a lot of us as we That's right. Life. That's exactly right. Yeah, I was just abandoning myself all the time. I was a caretaker, taking care of everybody else's feelings, completely ignoring my own. And then at that point, I was really sick and wondering, why was I so sick? You can't do that your whole life. You get depleted. You get sick. And it was at that point, fortunately, that inner bonding came in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is such a beautiful and powerful process. And obviously, it was an inspired gift to the world for you to have the, you know, I call them sometimes divine downloads when, when, right, that's what it was. Yeah. And, and such a beautiful and powerful process that I know has impacted so, so, so many women and men out there, so many people out there. And um, I just feel really grateful that we get to share this. Uh, share your work, Margaret, because I just think it's incredibly powerful. So many people. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I do think it's such a huge obstacle and block to having the kind of relationships that we all so deeply desire. So that's, that's right. so powerful. You know, it's so interesting how sometimes it's a matter of of seeing things that we haven't seen before and how something like that can make a, a world of difference. Oh yeah. What's it possible does. for us. Right. So I love that your work can change those perspectives and those shifts can create such openings of possibility for people. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So I know also Margaret, that you have a wonderful ebook, uh, called The Six Secrets to Profound Self-Love and Joyous Connection. So right. you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, like my books are kind of channeled. I, I sit down, I just let them come through. And so this is um, a book like that that will really help people to start to tune into the inner bonding process. It'll be very, very helpful. Mm, it's wonderful. Wonderful. So for everyone that's watching or listening, you can click on the link below here on this page. And that will take you to the place where you can opt in to get Margaret's wonderful ebook. Because I know we've just kind of scratched the surface, although right. you've given us a beautiful overview in this brief amount of time. I know that there's so much depth and richness to your work, and I know so many people are going to want to be connected with you. So everybody, check out check out that link and get Margaret's ebook. And Margaret. Before we wrap, I also want to give you a last chance to share any last words of wisdom or a last final thought. But I also just really want to thank you for your generosity and sharing and your beautiful work in the world. It's it's really profound and really life changing. I know that. So really great. You know, I just want to encourage people to try the process. It does take practice, like learning to play the piano takes practice, but I just, it always works when you do it. That's the thing about inner bunny. It always works when you do it. And so uh, I just really want to encourage you to learn the process. There's also a free course on our website that you can take. There's many ways to learn the process. And really anybody can learn it if they really want to become a more loving human being. And I think that's what our planet needs right now. Absolutely. Beautiful. And what's your main website, Margaret, for people? It's, yeah, it's innerbonding.com. 
Okay, yes. innerbonding.com. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this and I really appreciate your contribution to the event. And Margaret and I also appreciate all of you who've chosen to join us today. We know you have lots of options of what you do with your time. And we hope to create something that blesses you for the time that you've spent with us and hope you'll join us for more of the event as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope to thank see you, you everyone. in interviews. And thank Bye -bye. you, Margaret. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.